more than half of the WNBA teams have let go of their head coach and a quarter also need a new GM. We're also looking at the first week of NBA action and the potential consequences on college sports from the election. It's Tuesday, October 29th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're talking about all the coach and GM firings in the WNBA with our reporter Colin Salau. Former NBA exec Scott Perry discusses what's happening in the NBA. And later, our reporter Amanda Krisovich looks into the potential consequences for college sports from next week's election. We also have updates on the Rays stadium situation, college basketball, the Premier League, and the NBA. Here are your top headlines. October is a special time of year, as it's typically the only time sports fans can watch all four major American sports leagues in a single day. Last night marked one of those rare sports equinoxes with Game 3 of the World Series, Monday Night Football between the Giants and the Steelers, eight NHL games, and a whopping 11 NBA games. The MLS playoffs were also underway as well. It's the first and likely only sports equinox we'll see in 2024, as there are no more World Series games scheduled to coincide with NFL games on Thursday, Sunday, or Monday. Allegiant Stadium, home of the Las Vegas Raiders, is set to host four collegiate basketball powerhouses over two games in 2027. The event will pit Duke against Arizona and Kansas against Indiana in the Naismith Hall of Fame series. The games will open up the 2027 college basketball season and are meant to serve as a warm-up for the 2028 Final Four, which will also be held in Allegiant Stadium. Two children and a grandchild of Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones were involved in a car accident on the way to Sunday night's game between the Cowboys and the 49ers. The car collided with a rising barricade on the way to Levi Stadium. All of the Joneses involved were medically cleared and attended the game in the visitor's owner's suite. Jerry Jones was in a separate car when the accident occurred. Manchester United fired manager Eric Ten Hag after a 2-1 loss to West Ham United. Ten Hag was informed yesterday morning and leaves the club after two and a half years of the helm. Despite winning two domestic trophies with United, the Carabao Cup in 2023, and last year's FA Cup, Ten Hag has slipped down the Premier League standings, finishing in third in 2023, eighth in 2024, and is currently leaving the club in 14th place out of 20 Premier League teams. The club is working on next steps to appoint Sporting Lisbon's Ruben Amorim as their next manager. Kansas City Royals catcher Salvador Perez won the Roberto Clemente Award for his long-standing dedication to the Kansas City community. Perez has also been lauded for his philanthropic work in not just KC, but his home country of Venezuela as well. Perez is the first Royal to win the award and said, it means a lot after winning a World Series. This award is the second best award I've ever won. After the Connecticut Sun let go of head coach Stephanie White, there were more WNBA teams without a head coach than with one. There are also now three GM openings with the Aces firing Natalie Williams. Reporter Colin Salo explains what's going on here next. I'm joined now by front office sports reporter Colin Salo. Welcome, Colin. Hey, Owen. Always nice to be here. Great to have you on. So crazy things happening in the happening in the WNBA before this weekend. Already six of the teams, six of the twelve teams, had fired their head coaches. Half the league over the weekend. The Las Vegas Aces fired their GM Natalie Williams on Monday. The Connecticut Sun uh, parted ways. Is the language everyone's using with their head coach Stephanie White. Um, so we'll start with the sun here. Um, so this is now seven out of 12 teams have fired their head coaches or, you know, don't have a head coach uh, anymore. Should we see the sun who made the semifinals this past season as part of that same trend? A little bit of yes and no, I'd say. I think there's a lot of reporting specifically by the Chicago Sun-Times, Annie Costable, that she's expected to to come, uh, Stephanie White in particular is expected to actually return to the Indiana fever, uh, where she coached for, you know, a while. And so it might be a little bit different because there's already a place for her to go. And, and she's actually been, that's why the language of parting ways is being used here because she did have one more year in her contract with the sun, but it seems as though she had been, you know, even potentially go, uh, potentially interviewing with the sky as well, um, for their coaching, uh, search. So, she might just be kind of the collateral of all this, uh, all the other head coaching vacancies. But those, um, which are the teams that haven't performed as well, um, it, it seems like that might be just teams who are are thinking about this influx of money. You know, looking across the league potentially for who they could get, who has more you know pedigree, and that they can potentially pay for. Um, and you know, Stephanie White is is one of those, and it just so happens that she was already under contract with another WNBA team. 
Right. So it's all kind of one big story, right? Where, yeah, all this money is coming into the league from their new media deal, from expansion fees. And so some teams, you know, might be looking to level up <clears throat> with their coach. And but in the case of Stephanie White, she might be a coach who's leveling up in terms of pay, uh, maybe, you know, going obviously going to a team that's probably not if assuming she does make her way to the fever um, to a team that didn't do as well last year as the sun, but obviously they have Caitlin Clark, they have reasons for optimism and she may have reasons for optimism in terms of how much she's getting paid. Yeah. She's also from Indiana. So, you know, there's, there's probably that, that, that comes with it. She has a relationship with their front office. Um, and, and, and yeah, I, I think that if you have all of that going for you and now the team says, Hey, we could pay you a lot more because of this influx of media rights money, this influx of expansion fee money, um, you know, why not go home? I think any of us would would have that in our minds if our jobs offered that to us. Uh, and let's go over to the Aces. So this was something of a surprise, at least for me, uh, because the Aces have been you know, arguably the most successful franchise of the last few years. They won two championships, made it to the semifinals. They still have the MVP and Angel Wilson. Uh, what did you make of their GM, Natalie Williams, being shown the door? Yeah, so while we're talking about seven head coaching vacancies, there's also three general manager changes, right, across the league. Um, and for the Aces, I think you could easily point at their at at on court at the at the on court success, quote unquote, of the team. They won two championships with Natalie Williams, and then they didn't even make the finals this year with pretty much the same core. But I think that's kind of a, an easy way out to say, hey. You don't have a championship, but also there's been a lot of off-court issues that have kind of hampered the Aces. First with, um, you know, the, the money that's being given to the players. Uh, there's a Las Vegas organization that offered, you know, players $100,000 each for uh, to, to promote the city, which is being investigated on by the league. Um, that's on top of the investigation with Dierica Hamby that both the league and the Aces are going through for how they treated her through uh, her pregnancy, where she's claiming that she was discriminated upon by the Aces organization, which led to her being traded to the Los Angeles Sparks. Um, the Eric Hamby herself even uh, tweeted that it's a beautiful day um, on, on, you know, when Natalie Williams was, was let go. So there's clearly a lot that's, that's going on off the court for the Aces. And, now that they can't point at, hey, you won us a championship, um, it might be one of those things where the time the writing was just on the wall considering all the other things involved. Yeah, and you got to wonder, and maybe the Hamby case, maybe um, the other, I'll, I'll describe the other one in a moment, but you know, maybe she was going to get pushed out one way or another. It's a little too soon to tell, but it could be one of these things where it's like, we're, we're letting you go before we're forced to do this anyway. Yeah, I mean, the Aces... They've been they've stood strong with with Becky Hammond and you know despite Becky Hammond's suspension they've they've a aligned with her, um, but we haven't heard much about the, the Natalie Williams side of it and uh, it seems like you know the she was you know she was he she was headed out like you said, yeah and just uh, um, provide the details on the other case so yeah the that Las Vegas tourism agency uh, is pr uh, giving every Aces players at a hundred thousand dollars to promote Las Vegas. And it's sort of like, is this just, they're each getting their own separate sponsorship deal, or is this essentially like they're getting their salaries doubled or tripled? Um, and, you know, this is an inducement that the Aces can use. It's a little bit like the Liberty offering charter flights before that was allowed. Yeah, I mean, so, so it's the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. And pretty much they offered them $100,000 each uh, but but the whole thing is that the whole idea is that you're not allowed to offer these kind of endorsements with players if if the team is the one facilitating those deals, right? It has to kind of be through your agent. It has to be individually. But it, it it's odd because it's like, well, it's the whole Las Vegas team. And also when they made the public announcement, it was at the Las Vegas facilities. So the, the Aces facilities. So how is it? How is that the case? Like that's kind of where the the the, the investigations lie. Where it's how is it possible that the Aces were not involved in something like this, and now they're again embroiled in this investigation with the league that that has now have you know that's lawyers are investigating them, and that's not that's not ever a good look. And if all of these things are piling up, um, it's if it's not just one or two, and if it's been going on for pretty much Natalie Williams's tenure with the Aces, 
then you kind of got to look at, you know, the off court stuff now that you're not winning championships. So yeah, the aces are in some ways their own case. The sun is, you know, you know, maybe also kind of a, a unique scenario. We still have a situation where ha- more than half the league now needs a new head coach. A quarter of the league needs a new GM. Um, how should we kind of be conceptualizing this like off season of upheaval for the WNBA? Yeah, I think there are a couple of big points there. One, it's don't I don't think it's a coincidence that it is the unprecedented growth season that this comes after that uh, for the WNBA. A lot of money is going to come in, like I mentioned earlier, from a two point two mil- billion dollar media rights deal that could potentially go up to three billion. That's four times more or as much as 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 they had previously. Um, for, for their media rights deal per year. So there's going to be a lot of money coming in for teams that might not have have as much have had as much uh, to, to use uh, to hire high level coaches, to hire high level general manager general managers. So that could be one thing now that they're anticipating that money to come in in 2026, they could you know kind of start their search now and, and, and pull the trigger now. The other thing is that you know when there are front office changes as there are in a, in, in places like Indiana and Chicago, where their general managers weren't the ones who hired their head coach, the head coach that was that was in place. So a lot of times general managers, you, you see this not just in the WNBA, but in all professional sports, general managers and team presidents, they want to vet their their guy, their their coach. So if the one they put in is just someone they inherited, sometimes they kind of want someone who's who's in their direction, who, who who's you know pointing the same way as them. And with the sky, with the fever, that wasn't the case. And and you see what what's going on now. Them looking and trying to vet their own coach, and they're gonna you know find them. The Fever they had a relationship with Stephanie White. They brought back their old president. I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> Colin Salo, always insightful. Thanks for joining us on the show. Always great, great to be here, Owen. We still have no real idea where the Tampa Bay Rays will play next year, but we can likely cross a few cities off the list. According to various reports, Durham, home of the Rays AAA team, is not on the list, and neither are Nashville or Salt Lake City, both of which would like to audition as future MLB cities. Montreal, where the Rays once hoped to play half of their home games, is also essentially a non-starter. MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred would like some clarity on this by Christmas time, so the team has about two months to figure this out, though obviously that's not a real deadline, it's more of a wish for clarity as soon as it's feasible. The team is hoping to stay in the Tampa area. And while the facts on the ground haven't changed too much, the more I look at this, the more I think they're going to play in a minor league park for three years while their new stadium is being built. They've always been one of the weakest draws in MLB, and the repairs are probably going to be very expensive. The economics here point toward just muddling through until they have a brand new park. Over to the NBA, the Miami Heat unveiled a statue of Dwayne Wade on Sunday. He's the first Heat player to have a statue, and he's clearly deserving of the honor. He's the team's all-time leader in points, steals, assists, games, and minutes. This is the Heat's 36th season, and they have been celebrating their history first by naming their court after longtime coach and executive Pat Riley, and now the Wade statue. It's a great tribute to a great player. Wade was on hand for the unveiling, and he was very moved by the honor. And I'm happy about that because he deserves to be celebrated, and he did not seem bothered by the minor detail that the statue does not look like him. Someone out there on the internet said it looked more like Lawrence Fishburne, and I agree. The problem is that the sculpture shows him yelling or shouting with his mouth open and the top part of his face scrunched up. And there are a lot of impressively rendered details in that, but the end result is that it does not look like Dwayne Wade. He's wearing Wade's jersey, and he's in front of the Heat's arena, so the context clues give you enough. But if you had just shown me the face, you could have given me 100 guesses, and I would not have guessed Dwayne Wade. We're just a few games into the NBA season, but there's plenty to discuss from the early returns. I spoke with former NBA executive Scott Perry on what we've seen so far. Quick note, we recorded this on Monday afternoon before that night's games, so we refer to some 3-0 teams that are no longer 3-0. Here's our conversation. I'm joined now once again by longtime NBA executive Scott Perry. Welcome, Scott. Good to see you again, Owen. How you doing? Yeah, doing good. How you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Great, uh, great weekend. And uh, been watching a lot of basketball and looking forward to another Mm -hmm. great week of basketball coming up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, So on Sunday, Steph Curry hurt his ankle. It actually sounds like it's not going to be too severe. We're still waiting to hear, um, you know, if this is like days or weeks, Um, might be closer to days. Anyway, it got me thinking about just like the warrior, the state of the Golden State Warriors who, you know, were 
definitely out of the dynasty, but Curry's still there, Draymond's still there, though in a lesser form. Anyway, how central is Curry to this team at this point? He's still everything to this team, in my opinion, and here's why. The other 29 teams, when they get ready to uh, prepare to play the Warriors, guess what? They start with, with talking about how we're going to defend Steph Curry because uh, so much of what they do comes out of what he does on the offensive end. When he doesn't have the basketball, especially when he, he moves so well without it, knows how to use screens, he's in perpetual motion. So you always have to be aware of him because – aware of him and where he's going. So it is huge uh, when he is not in the lineup. Obviously, we know of his prowess as a tremendous three-point shooter. Uh, I believe he's an underrated passer as well. And let's not forget his leadership. He is the rock. He is the, the stable force that makes this Warriors organization go. And he's been doing it over the past decade, and taking him out. Different style of game, but it's no different than, let's say, uh, Nikola Jokic being out at uh, uh, Denver or Giannis being away uh, in Milwaukee. He has that kind of impact on this team, and the Warriors definitely need him if they're going to make any kind of noise this season uh, in terms of continue, uh, continuing in the Western Conference. Yeah, I started to think, you know, like, is he the most important person to his team? Um, and, you know, you can make that case, but... It got me thinking, like, there's actually a lot of teams where they're contenders right now to win the championship, but you take out one guy and, you know, like, that'd be Giannis, Luka, Jokic, um, you know, there's probably a few others that, uh, like, you, you can't really imagine them. They're probably in the playoffs, but they're not real title contenders without their best player. There's only a, a couple of teams where you could take out their best player and you'd still say, like, actually, this team could still make a run. No question about it. A lot of these teams are obviously built uh, with star heavy, if you will. I believe I mentioned last week just the importance of having depth. And when you lose one of your top players, can you keep the ship afloat? Can you stay a 500 basketball team? So let's you know, look at the 3 and 0 teams you have right now. Let's take the Los Angeles Lakers. You have two elite stars and obviously LeBron James and Anthony Davis. If one of those guys is out for 10 days, they have the luxury because they have two elite guys that that other guy can keep them afloat maybe in, uh, as a 500 team for that stretch. Uh, you look at the OKC Thunder, another 3-0 and team. Uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander, who is my favorite for MVP this year, if he's out for a little bit of time, you still have an emerging Jalen Williams, Chet Holmgren, who are excellent uh, second and third options on that team. And the depth that they've acquired, adding Hartenstein and, and Alex Caruso and um, a, a number of players on this team that I think can help keep the Thunder afloat. Uh, again, in a 10 game stretch, stay around 500 so you don't totally fall, fall off the cliff. Now, when you talk about winning a championship, it would be hard to win a championship when you lose, especially the all-star caliber player or that MVP caliber player. But uh, it, again, it gets down to having depth and players that can step up, at least in the short run, to keep your team viable and not falling off too deep. Yeah, and I feel like this is going to be a big question for teams building their rosters going forward because you, you can't replace these elite guys like if Luca was mm -hmm. suddenly a free agent like he yes. would get you know the biggest deal we could possibly ever see and that's just going to be true going forward because the salary cap's going to keep going up at the same time it can't just be that <clears throat> that one guy um no. and no. yeah you need you know like seven eight guys who you trust um yes. and a lot of them are going to be pretty expensive uh, and we saw with, like Paul George signing with the Sixers like I wouldn't put him as like a top 10 player in the NBA no. Um, but you know, he still gets this huge deal, uh, because yeah, they want their, like their third piece basically to, to right. try to make a run. Um, so yeah, I feel like, you know, we had the big three era and maybe kicked sort of kicked off by like the Celtics and the heat. Um, and I don't quite know what the new paradigm is. It feels like you need a, a mega star, like a Luca. Um, but like, if you can just be the Celtics and have everyone be really good. Yeah, right. Yeah. See, I, I love what the Celtics have done. You, you I, I agree because look, obviously Jason Tatum is a 
three-time first-team All-NBA player. Then you have Jalen Brown, who was the MVP of both the Eastern Conference Finals and the championship series. And those guys have been together a long time. You got Kristaps Porzingis, who's been an all-star before. Al Horford, who's been an all-star before. You have probably the best two-way guard in the league in Drew Holiday with his defensive prowess and his ability to make open threes and then throw in Derek White. So, again, there is a team that if for an odd, some odd reason, of whether it be injury of illness in short term to a Jalen Brown or to a, a Jason Tatum, they're still going to – have a chance to be really good during that stretch. Look, Christoph Spazingas was very important to this team, but they played a lot without him during the regular season last year. But again, to the depth and the overall balance of the roster, uh, if, if, I, if it's me, I'm always striving to try to put together the, the most balanced roster because you just never know uh, what happens in terms of you know, health and wellness when it comes to – a long 82 game season and then a, a, a playoff run where you got to win 16 games, anything can happen. So the deeper we are, the more balanced we are, the better chance that we have to overcome obstacles because they're not going to change the schedule and say, Oh, okay. Giannis is hurt or Luka Doncic is out. They're out for a month. Let's pause the season until they get back healthy. That's not happening. <laughs> Right. And, you know, that's like the luck of the playoffs is just who's healthy, yes. you know, who's, yes. who's you know ready to go after all that. Yes. Um, I actually want to jump back for the Warriors just to for a sec, um, because, you know, Steph's still there, but Clay's gone. Draymond isn't the guy he used to be. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if this is ha, are they like building their next core on any level? Because I feel like you could take out Steph and like, I guess people can still name Draymond, but like challenge your average basketball fan to name another warrior. And a lot of them cannot. Um, but at the same time, this is like this team can still look really good. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're quite title contenders, but I I'm wondering if they've no. kind of managed to like transition out of like that dynasty era into the next thing. I, th I think you see uh, what I see is an attempt to at least start building a younger group of core players. Now, they may not be star type players like the Steph Curry's and uh, the Clay Thompsons that they had before, or Kevin Durant when he came there. But you start looking at the Jonathan Kamingas, Brandon Pajemski, who I know they like a lot. Uh, they uh, signed Moses Moody to an extension. So there's some uh, Trace Jackson Davis. So there's some good, solid young players that as Steph Curry eventually moves on and moves out into retirement, that you just will, they will be there. They will understand the winning ways of Golden State, even if they don't have a championship, but they understand the environment. There'll be solid NBA players that you'll have an opportunity to go out and maybe add through free agency a star level player to help take that group and put them back into some sort of playoff contention or championship contention. But uh, I don't see anyone there now on the roster who's going to take the reins from Steph Curry and be the next star of the Golden State Warriors, at least not as of yet. But I do see some very good basketball players, the names I mentioned, who have a chance to be real solid NBA players. And you need those guys when you're talking about uh, sustaining your culture and, and going out and winning basketball games. But now you're going to need to either through the draft or through free agency when you, uh, when you do get the money uh, and the ability to get into free agency, to maybe go out and get a bigger name guy, uh, you know, bigger, higher talented guy, I should say. And uh, lastly, let's let's go uh, to Southern California. We learned over the weekend that Bronny James is is going to go back and forth between the NBA and the G League. I think a lot of people expected this uh, when the Lakers drafted him. Oh, uh, that you know they'll you know obviously they drafted him because he's LeBron's son, but mm -hmm. um, but now it's like kind of time to develop him as a basketball player. I'm just wondering what you kind of think about that whole situation. It's the best situ best thing for Bronny James is to get down to the G League and start playing a lot of minutes of basketball where he can really develop his game and start uh, cultivating exactly what type of player and role he's going to have when he does come back to the Lakers, whether it's later this season or next season or seasons beyond. I use an, I'll use, give you an example. 
Miles McBride, and they're a little different players. Miles had more co- collegiate experience coming in, but when we drafted Miles when I was in New York, one of my final seasons in New York. Spent a lot of time playing in the G League, developing that confidence, getting the experience, getting the minutes, and the trust continues to you know to grow from coaches and teammates seeing this guy every time he would come back up and play. Bronny James will have that same type. He he has to use this experience in the G League to gain some confidence, improve his shooting. That was something that Miles McBride needed to do as well, um, and. They're similar in size. They're kind of that tweener guard in between one and two position, but good athletes who can defend, have some toughness. So if I'm him, I would, if I'm Bronny, I'm looking at someone like a Miles McBride studying his game when he first came in and what he's doing now and try to figure out how he can duplicate to a degree. I mean, he's his own person and he has his own set of unique skills, if you will, but still it's always good to have an example that you can point to that spent two, three years really in a G league and not getting a lot of time um, and getting a lot of DMPs on the big roster. But then all of a sudden that opportunity comes, you're playing and you're ready to, uh, to, uh, fulfill that opportunity because you've played all these minutes in the G League. You've had some success. You've learned, you've developed, and you're ready to go. And the beauty for him, he can do this, let's hope, without the limelight that has been uh, bestowed upon him because he's playing right next to his famous father uh, he, every time he hits the court. Now he can be on his own. The cameras are going to follow his dad all around the NBA, let Bronny develop uh, behind the scenes, if you will. And uh, I think it's great for him. And uh, he's going in the right attitude. I read what he said before, and I read what his agent has said, uh, Rich Paul, everybody's going to embrace it. And uh, that's a big part of that too, is embracing uh, that opportunity. All right. We'll leave it there. Scott Perry, thanks so much for joining us on the show. All right. Thank you, Owen. The election is in a week from today, and it is going to impact nearly every part of the country, and that includes college sports. The presidential race gets most of the attention, but when it comes to the future of the NCAA, control of the Senate might be a bigger factor. My colleague Amanda Kristovich explains that next. Joined now by front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Doing fine. How are you? I'm doing well. Never a slow news day, that's for no, sure. No, it would be nice if we had one of those. Um, but we've got this election coming up, as as you may have heard, as you've written about. Um, <laughs> and um, basically, there are eight permutations, technically, between because the House, the Senate, and the presidency are all in play. Um, some of those permutations more likely than others, based on how things correlate. Anyway, um, this is going to have consequences for a lot of things, including the NCAA and if college athletes become employees and how much money they can get paid, et cetera. Um, You've been looking into this. Is there, is this become a partisan thing where Democrats want one thing and Republicans want another thing? Well, it's interesting. I think um, the oversimplification would be yes. Um, You know, as anyone who is watching the election just generally will probably start to notice um, the Biden administration is known as being extremely pro labor and um, a Harris administration would theoretically be similar. Um, And, you know, that is something that a lot of Democrats take pride in, the ability to unionize, to collectively bargain, um, all of those sort of traditional pro-labor values. Um, On the Republican side, however, they're a little more employer friendly, um, and it's definitely been a sticking point about, you know, sort of like this partisan football about, you know, The Democrats are too pro-labor, the Republicans are too anti-labor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And the athlete employment issue in some cases relates to that because it relates to athletes um, also having the ability to unionize and collectively bargain. However, I do want to add the caveat that the NCAA has been very successful in sort of explaining what they see as the pitfalls of an employment model. 
Um, and some Democrats, especially, you know, I would say some of the more left leaning Democrats on the college athletes rights issue um, appear to be a little bit more amenable to the idea of not having athletes be employees, but still giving them some sort of you know, protections and, and promised rights that um, they could negotiate through legal collective bargaining. Um, so the short answer to your question is like, mostly yes, but not 100%. Yeah, I mean, it's a relatively new issue. And so maybe we just haven't had enough time for partisan sorting. But it also it feels like maybe there's opportunity to uh, have this not just be a, whoever's in power, the policy flips back and forth. Um, that said, is there, you know, particular legislation or policies that uh, do essentially hinge on this election? I think the question of whether there will be any NCAA um, related legislation hinges on the election. Um, if I think one of the big points that I learned in reporting the story is that, you know, if the Republicans take the Senate, um, and Senator Ted Cruz becomes the chair of the commerce committee, the commerce committee is, um, the committee that has uh, jurisdiction over these athlete compensation issues. And Cruz has been very, very clear in on record public comments that if he gets control of Senate commerce, he will absolutely uh, make it a priority to get some sort of athlete compensation legislation, um, you know, through the committee and to the floor for a vote. I think, you know, what is going to be in that bill um, remains to be seen. Uh, Cruz released a discussion draft of a bill in 2023 that was extremely pro NCAA. Um, a, at least one Democratic aide that I spoke with said it's like not athlete friendly. Obviously, you know, I think that Senator Cruz would disagree with that characterization. Um, you know, but it's unlikely based on the conversations that I've had that, it, you know, a, an actual law would look extremely similar to Cruz's discussion draft because, um, you know, the NCA folks that are working on this issue in Congress and, you know, even Republican aides say, hey, like, we're expecting to have to get some sort of bipartisan support. Um, we are expecting to have to make compromises and concessions. Although I will say that, um, you know, having athletes not be employees seems to be something that is very important to at least some of the Republicans um, that are interested in this issue. Um, so, you know, it, I think it sort of remains to be seen whether they can negotiate things like, you know, healthcare protections or extra benefits for athletes that, um, you know, would allow Senate Democrats, House Democrats, et cetera, enough of them to sign on to a no employment bill. But again, since because of the union issue, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure, um, you know, and I spoke with one lobbyist who said they weren't 100 percent sure that um, sort of any of these provisions would convince Democratic lawmakers to sign on to a bill that could be seen as preventing athletes from unionizing. Yeah, I mean, I think um, because it's, you know, it's an issue that doesn't have a um, obvious partisan split, uh, maybe shades of that, but not the full on like, just like, I know your party, I know how you feel about this. Um, yeah, and because it's likely to be a very closely divided government, um, you know, even if it's all one one party in control, uh, yeah, it feels like there's going to have to be some amount of bipartisan negotiating. Mm -hmm. But I could see the question of employment becoming that bright line of, you know, some people will not cross that line, no matter what else is in the bill. Um, but yeah, maybe there's enough you know, between healthcare and other ways for athletes to make money. Um, maybe there's enough to to get something over the finish line. And probably if it gets to the president, whoever that is, um, they'll sign it just because if it's if it's been through that whole process. Uh, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> just hard to say at this point. Um, would you say the Senate is the sort of the most important fulcrum here who's in control? I mean, look, I think so. I mean, obviously, you know, we could see movement in the House, but I think that, you know, 
it's less about the fact that, you know, it's the Senate as a body and more just about the fact that, you know, Ted Cruz would be at the helm in the Senate. And he's made it very clear that, um, you know, this is a priority for him and it will be a priority for him. So, you know, I haven't necessarily heard that same sort of language um, coming from the House side. So I think that's sort of like why I'm focusing on um, or at least not really me my sources, right, have told me to focus on the Senate. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get an update on this particular story in two weeks. Amanda Christovich, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Time now for Front Office Sports tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. On December 9th, the Cowboys will play the Bengals, and you'll be able to watch the normal game or the Simpsons characters playing the game. The game will be animated in real time and shown on Disney Plus and ESPN Plus. The Simpsons version of the game will be at Adams Stadium, which has appeared in the show a number of times and is thought to be modeled after AT&T Stadium in Dallas, where the actual football game will be played. The NFL did something similar last year with Toy Story, and they've had games called by SpongeBob and his friends and games on Nickelodeon where slime explodes out of the end zone when someone scores a touchdown. The NFL is never content to just be the dominant force in American media. They're working to entice the next generation. But in this case, I don't know if the next generation is watching The Simpsons. Maybe they are. Someone is. It's still on the air. Maybe this is a way for parents to introduce their kids to the NFL and The Simpsons. Seasons three through eight are solid gold. Some of the best TV ever produced. After that, you're on your own. That's it for today. Rate us and review us wherever you like to tune in and tell a friend about the show. We'd always appreciate it. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.